Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiterter, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. I've decided to upload another compilation video. Uh, quite a few of you enjoyed my last one um, over the weekend. So, um, and I've also got loads of short videos that um, are taking up memory on my device. So it's a good way of uploading them. And uh, again, a lot of you really enjoyed the format. So I thought I'll do another. Uh, I will be doing several more as well over the course of the next few months. So this is patient one. They attended with fully occluding dead skin. You can see all those dead skin ribbons that I just extracted. They have a very bendy and twisty ear canal, as you may have just seen when I entered the ear. And the ear canal, eardrum's nice and healthy, but the entrance of the ear canal in particular was very narrow. It was collapsed. The cartilage um, portion of the ear canal, which is the outer third, as we age, um, it's possible for this cartilage to weaken, similar to the tip of our nose, which is also made up of cartilage, and you can get a droopy nasal tip. And in the same way, some elderly patients may develop a collapsed entrance to the ear canal. Another plausible cause as to why the entrance of the ear canal can be collapsed is the, the back section of the cartilage. So the cartilage making up, forming the back wall of the ear canal can sometimes continue to grow and overextend, so it loses the structural support, it collapses over. So in those cases, if, it's, if it was warranted, say if you're developing from, uh, and suffering from chronic ear infections, an ENT surgeon may decide to trim that and perform a canaloplasty, but um, if it's not causing the patient any problems and they just need to have their ears clean once in a while, then that's the more conservative approach. So this is patient two. Patient two, as you can see, they have got this really dry, matted, um, earwax and dead skin. In fact, there's so much matted hair here, it looks like a nest. Now, whilst you're watching this, um, I received a comment over the weekend um, and I have replied back. So I'll just hope like um, the, the person who left a comment will read my reply. But um, they made reference to the fact that I um, was mentioned on national radio. There was a shout out and um, whether I'd heard it and I, and I wasn't aware. So it'd be great if anyone is aware of... Um, this uh, particular shout out that was given on my behalf on the radio, uh, please do let me know because I can then listen back and thank the individual, uh, the person who, who uh, mentioned the radio. It'd be nice to get in contact with them and thank them. And obviously I don't know what context uh, it, my name was made, um, that was, was mentioned and referenced, but it would appear it was in a nice way because um, the comment um, stipulated whether I'd heard the shout out in, in a... In a, in a jovial kind of manner so yeah if anyone um is aware of this do let me know it'd be great to find out um, and thank the individual so i've just put some olive oil spray in here to loosen the more lateral wax and dead skin and all these hairs you can see now these hairs uh, have entered the ear either because the patient has been using a cotton bud so they, they when you use a cotton bud and you're just giving it a good swirl around in your ear you can sometimes detach and pull out some of these hairs that are protruding from the ear canal. So these hairs should only be situated on the outer third, the cartilaginous portion. And that's for the reason the cartilage portion, the skin that lines it, has the dermis layer, which is the middle layer of the skin. So you just, the, ear, the skin is formed of three layers. You've got the epidermis, the outermost layer. That's your protective barrier, if you like. Then you've got the dermis layer, which is where the hair follicles are located. And the erector muscles, which help the hairs to project outwards. Um, and also the dermis layer can, can contain collagen and elastin. And then you've got the subcutaneous layer, which is made up of insulating fat and connective tissue. Um, whereas the inner two thirds of the ear canal, the bony part, you only have that epidermis. So there's no dermis layer. Therefore, it's not possible for hair follicles and therefore hair strands to protrude outwards in the bony section of the ear canal. So whenever you see hairs deeper in the ears, either because the patient has been using a cotton bud aggressively or some other um, uh, weapon of choice, if you like, and these hairs have become loose and just migrated into the ear, or, and it's probably the more likeliest reason, a lot of patients trim the hairs around their ears, which is not a problem, and some of these loose hairs can uh, then fly and travel into the ear. So. If that's the case, I always recommend the patient just to get some cotton wool. Don't push it in your ear, just, um, just position it at the entrance to seal the entrance. So that prevents the hairs from flying in. 
because once you've got hairs in your ear like this patient sometimes can mat and it prevents the wax from naturally migrating outwards now there's no need for me to remove these hairs because it's not really affecting the removal and the hairs are just going to grow back um, it's not going to stop um, this patient's wax from reforming uh, and the hairs will grow quicker than the wax will naturally just expel itself so it's no real need um, and in addition, you always run the risk of the patient developing folliculitis, so that's an infection of the hair follicle. So if it's not causing you a problem, it's best left alone. Um, a colleague of mine, well actually my mentor, is an ENT surgeon, Mr. Darish Rajali, uh, in extreme cases he's taught me how to pluck the hair, so we used to use the forceps. Very rare that I need to do that actually. I can't remember the last time that I actually have. But that's a, a, another mechanism. So I'm just mopping up. There's a bit of soft skin, wax, just at the base of the ear canal. If it doesn't come away, we're just going to leave that. It's not going to affect the patient's hearing. And the last thing I want to do is cause a microabrasion against the canal wall, which then leads to the patient developing an infection. To remove something, that really is not really going to affect the patient. Um, and you can see this bit here on the anterior canal wall. Again, we're going to hover over if it doesn't come away, which a bit of it did, but I'm just going to leave that. So patient three, this is a patient who attended with a, ras uh, a radical mastoid cavity. So the bone behind the ear, and you can actually uh, feel it yourself, it's a flat surface bone. If you get your finger, go behind the pinna, so the flap of skin on, on the side of your head where the ear is. Position your finger there. That bone is called the mastoid bone. It's just it's the bone behind the ear canal, and it has a honeycomb structure. Now, sometimes the mastoid bone can get infected, and we call that mastoiditis. And that can be due to a middle ear infection, so any discharged fluid behind the eardrum. Uh, from the middle ear, you can gain access to the mastoid bone as a region called the antrum. Um, so, and because the mastoid bone is air-filled, it's honeycomb structure, it's porous, it can absorb a lot of the infection. And sometimes ENT surgeons perform a mastoidectomy in, uh, when they're trying to remove a cholesteatoma. So a cholesteatoma can also grow inwards um, in the middle ear and enter the mastoid space via the antrum. So in this case, this patient had a, a cholesterol so the ENT surgeon drilled out the mastoid bone from behind the ear and to, get, to, to remove all the infected bone and, and to expose any cholesterol that may be remaining. Because with a cholesterol which is, um, if you're not aware of what a cholesterol is, it can be a very serious um, cyst of dead skin that, it's very destructive and it can self-grow. And a cholesterol has the potential to, to grow upwards towards the brain, leading to a brain abscess, meningitis, potential death. It can invade inwards into the middle ear, affect the organ of hearing, the organ of balance. It can also affect the facial nerve. It can grow backwards like it has in this particular case uh, and infect the mastoid bone. And it can grow forwards into the jaw, the TMJ, the temporal, temporal um, um, mandula jaw joint so um the so ent drilled out all the mastoid bone to reveal the uh, the entire middle ear space to ensure there's no residual cholesterol um and then they've repositioned the eardrum over the the ossicles um put a cartilage graft there and they've also i think in this case sealed the eustachian tube to prevent the eardrum from retracting and a potentially a, a, a secondary cholesterol forming in the future. Now, when you've got a, a mastoid cavity like this, it's very difficult for the skin that lines the ear canal and also now the mastoid because this is no longer just the ear canal, it's the ear canal alongside the mastoid cavity, so hence why it's so big. So it's difficult for the skin to naturally migrate out of the ear and then dead skin in the ear, if it's left there for a long time, it has the potential of forming into a, a canal cholesterol or even a middle ear cholesterol Um, Dead skin also releases proteolytic enzymes, uh, which can start being quite destructive and decaying the, um, the skin that's lining the ear canal, the, the fresher layer of skin causing ulcerations, and then possibly causing structural damage around the ear and um, the mastoid region. So uh, patients who suffer from, uh, who have a mastoid cavity do need to have their ears examined on a regular basis to ensure there's no collection of dead skin. Um, patients with mastoid cavities as well, when you're performing microsuction, they can sometimes experience vertigo, dizziness, and that's because 
the organ of balance, which are three semicircular canals, which are fluid filled with hair cells. The mastoid bone, when it's intact, um, almost provides a buffer to the organ of hearing, uh, organ of balance, in particular the horizontal or lateral semicircular canal, which protrudes towards the entrance of the ear. But when that bone is drilled away, that particular semicircular canal no longer has the, the protection of the bone in front of it. And when you perform microsuction, it can reduce um, the, the ear pressure and also temperature. And because that lateral canal is exposed, it, you can get dizzy as a result because the organ of balance is susceptible to pressure and temperature changes itself. Um, so you've got to be careful um, when you're performing microsuction in a patient with uh, a radical mastoid cavity. So patient four, really dry, impacted, um, medially um, located wax and dry skin. It's really crusty and the exterior surface, it's extremely rough. And these procedures can be a bit tricky because as you're bringing it out of the ear, the patient can feel the wax rubbing against the canal wall. Hence why I've put some olive oil spray in there to provide some duplication. Also, it enables me to get a better suction grip. And again, this patient's got a really bendy and twisty ear canal. As we enter, the ear canal veers off to the right and then back to the left. See, they've got quite a lot of dry skin near the entrance. So what I'm going to do here is just remove some of these fragments of dead skin. They're very uh, dry and crusted. So just want to, whilst we're there, remove those. Patient five. So this is a dead skin buildup in the ear. You can see the texture. You can actually see the almost ribbon structure of the dead skin. So I'm just peeling this away from the roof of the ear canal. And again, you can just see how dry this patient's ear is. So they, the ear appears not to be producing all the natural oils and sweats that it needs in order to hydrate, moisturize the skin. So these natural oils and sweats that I make reference to, they eventually form earwax. They, they, they are sebum, which is a, the oily uh, fatty secretion also found in our scalp, and an oily sweat that's secreted by modified apocrine glands, and, uh, which are also found in the armpit. So this oily sweat and sebum, um, the outer third of the ear canal produces these via the sebaceous glands, which produce sebum, and ceremonious glands, which produce the oily sweat. And as these oils and sweat reach the surface of the ear canal, um, so sebum typically travels up the, the root of the hair strand, whereas um, the oily sweat from the ceremonious glands, they have separate pores. So they, either way, they find, them, they find their root to the surface of the ear canal. And then these oils and sweats naturally dissipate. They start to spread and coat and create a thin film over the ear canal and also the eardrum. And this layer of oily sweat and uh, fatty secretion, it moisturizes the skin. It's a natural moisturizer. So it prevents the skin from um, drying out. And this secretion is oil, lipid membrane. Um, it's also acidic, mildly acidic, which helps to repel insects. And also it helps to inhibit harmful bacterial and fungal growth. And uh, these oils and sweats, um, as our, the skin in the ear canal dies and sheds and exfoliates itself, the dead skin cells merge and amalgamate with these sweats and oils to eventually form earwax. For the majority of the population, uh, and this is the UK um, statistics, I would say between 90 to 95% there or thereabouts, this earwax then naturally migrates out of the ear. So the ear constantly recycles old earwax with new earwax. It, it, it expels old earwax and replaces it with new earwax. And the way it does that is that the skin that lines the ear canal and eardrum, as it dies and sheds, it moves sideways out of the ear like a conveyor belt. So any wax sitting on the surface is naturally transported out of the ear. How great is that? that our ears have evolved to, to be able to do that. Um, and the ear has to do that because if it doesn't, then everyone on, the, on planet Earth will have a blocked ear on a regular basis due to dead skin. The skin just wouldn't migrate. Um, when you've got skin, other parts of your body, and that skin dies and sheds, it just falls onto the floor. But with our ear, it will collect it. There's no other mechanism to, for the ear to expel any dead skin. Um, 
than the one I've just outlined. And we call that the epithelial migration. So epithelial is the outer skin cells that form the epidermis. So patient six, you can see they've got this, they've got otitis externa here. It's damp, dead skin, and it's mushy, it's glutinous. Now, I don't have the backstory. A lot of these procedures were performed uh, a while back, so I'm just looking at these almost for the first time in a while. Um, even at this very early stage, the patient can hear a lot better because we have revealed their eardrum. Now, they have got inflammation of the ear canal. They've got edema, so swelling, and they've just got this thick, dead skin. It's macerated, so I suspect this patient has been using some form of drops will be getting water in their ears if it is drops it's most likely going to be water-based drops like hydrogen peroxide drops or sodium bicarbonate drops because water-based drops uh, when you use them in the ear the skin cells uh, absorb the, the, the water um, causing the skin cells to hydrate and swell until they eventually burst from the membranes and then you get a maceration of the skin, so a softening of the skin. And when you've got a softening of the skin, the epidermis layer is breached um, and it allows uh, harmful bacteria and fungi to colonise and um, reproduce and multiply, and which can then lead to an infection. So it's one of the negatives of getting water in your ear. So although the eardrum is visible, what I'm doing here is just removing as much debris as possible as safely as possible we don't want to cause any further trauma when your ear canal is is already inflamed it's susceptible to um, undergoing um, further trauma when you're using instrumentation because you can quite easily pierce the soft delicate skin and you know further exacerbate any uh, uh, infection that's already in the ear so we want to do this as sensibly as possible, but the reason why I want to remove as much as possible is because this patient, is, if they haven't already, I would be uh, writing to their GP to have some topical antibiotic or antifungal, so they probably need a swab first, but um, spray or ointment um, to be applied into the ear. And when you've got all this gunk and debris and discharge, it's not going to penetrate the epidermis layer of skin. So we want to reveal as much of the flesh and the skin as possible. So it allows these drops the best opportunity to do their job and inhib inhibit the bacterial fungal growth. I don't know why, I've just got a feeling this is a fungal infection, candida, probably maybe with a bit of aspergillus as well, because there's a couple of black spores I found in there now. Um, most ear infections are bacterial in nature. I think the statistics are 80 or 70%, and the remaining 20 or 30 is fungal. And with a fungal infection, I think, again, 80% of fungal ear infections are aspergillus nigen. They're easily recognisable. You get um, these woolly cotton wool strands that appear, almost like spider's webs, and fungal spores. Then you get different types of aspergillus. You can get aspergillus niger or aspergillus flavus, and there must be some other ones as well. Um, so this, when it's cr thick and creamy, normally it's more candida. A bacterial pseudomonas infection can be a bit more, less viscous and sometimes green in appearance. But it's, yeah, it's more thin and watery in consistency, whereas this is really thick. So, and you can see slowly, you can see that um, the white layer of skin. So that's a, f a more recently um, a layer of skin that has died and shedded or beginning its process to shed. So we've just got this back section. Now this is on the posterior canal wall. The way I'm holding the endoscope here is slightly different um, because the, I suspect the patient's tilted their head back because it's more comfortable for them. So the hammer bone, Instead of being um, orientated um, from 12 o'clock to the midline, it's actually orientated so it's, it's uh, at 9 o'clock going to the midline. So this patient's got their head back. You can see just how dry the skin is and the inflammation, the swelling. 
So again, I'm really pleased with that. I think I might just try and get a bit more at the front here. You can see this thick layer of skin, a blanket of skin, and we just try to get the suction tip onto this and then slowly peel it towards the eardrum. And then there's a little bit left on the back part of the ear canal, so let's see if I can get that. But already I'm really pleased with this. I know some viewers may not be happy with it and um, possibly send me some emails to uh, <laughs> express their disgust. Um, that does happen, guys, believe it or not. <laughs> but I'm really, really pleased with this. Again, I'm just touching the eardrum here, just delicate, just kissing the surface just to get some of this dampness away. By trying drying out the ear as much as possible, it's going to... When the ear is moist, damp and dark and wet as it is, it's the perfect incubating environment for bacterial and fungal growth. So if we can remo re remove all this debris and the moisture, moist, um, dampness and moisture from the ear, it's only going to help the patient. And the key thing for this patient is to avoid water. Water is just only going to make this infection worse. Again, I'm just going to go to the front part of the ear canal. So although this looks to be the roof of the patient's ear canal, it's actually the front section. It's just the way the patient's orientated. Now, I've just noticed the hair there. Now, it's interesting. Sometimes when you're performing the procedure, you don't actually see these things. You're more focused on all the debris. And that hair was actually an external hair. I could see it protruding outward. So just by putting tucking the hair behind the ear, that hair came out of the ear, I'm sure. So this is patient seven. They've got really dark uh, oxidized wax. It's been there for a while. And I've just put some olive oil spray in right from the beginning just to change the consistency. So I suspect this wax is quite glutinous and soft and sticky. So when you vacuum it, it can clog up the inside of the suction tube. So what the oil does, Actually, it does several things. It lubricates the ear canal wall, so it helps to naturally extract this wax with minimal friction and resistance. The oil also acts to bind the wax together. I always compare olive oil drops for earwax, similar to uh, an egg in, in, in a fish cake or a potato cake recipe. It helps to bind all the ingredients together. And also, the oil helps to lubricate the inside of the suction tube. So it helps to minimise blockages and it's worked to treat. You can see how this wax is binded together and I'm slowly extracting it so there's less resistance. And I'm just making these little circular motions. So we're near the entrance and the entrance is a bit narrower and there's quite a bendy ear canal as well. So I'm just trying to bring this around the bend. So this wax is now visible from the external ear just some residual wax that came apart from the main block. Again, it's a good image of how bendy this patient's ear canal is. The endoscope's directed straight ahead. Um, so we have to go to the left and then back to the right. You can see the patient's incus, which is the middle bone there. Um, there was a bit of residual wax near the entrance. Just going to leave that. It's not a problem. Patient eight, as you can see there, all the hallmarks of this patient using a cotton swab or uh, a cotton bud as it's known in the UK or Q-tip as, as it's known in America. You can see the bruising to the um, inferior um, posterior canal wall and this dead skin and wax, it's, it's solidly impacted up against the eardrum. This patient's really pushed the cotton bud deep in the ear compressing this soft wax and skin up against the eardrum. I think I'm using the fine end suction probe here because we're working quite close to the eardrum. The fine end helps to reduce the noise level. Uh, micro suction can be quite noisy, especially as you approach the eardrum. Um, it's tolerable. Um, probably uh, two out of 100 patients make reference to the noise where it's, ex it's extremely noisy. But all in all, it's very tolerable. But um, being exposed to um, loud sounds right up against the eardrum, um, if we can minimise that, it's going to reduce any potential risk of this patient suffering from post-procedural reduced hearing, 
uh, what we call a temporary threshold shift and is normally temporary um, and also tinnitus which is a ring or buzzing noise in the ear which can sometimes occur secondary to noise exposure so a fine end helps to do that and with a fine end because it's smaller diameter if we do come in contact with the eardrum it's far less likely to cause any trauma so this is patient nine this is a, uh, a very interesting case again this is of a patient who attended with b9 osteonecrosis uh, what is b9 osteonecrosis well it's uh, when the bony part of the ear canal has reduced blood supply, so reduced vascularization, and it causes the underlying bone to then decay. Uh, we call that necrosis of the bone, which can eventually lead to sequestrum, and that's when, when the bone starts decaying, you get fragments of bone that separate from the main um, portion of the bone. And that, when you've got a portion of the ear canal where the bone starts decaying, and it normally, with this condition, B9 osteonecrosis, it's the, it's the inferior canal wall, so the bottom part of the ear canal. Um, the underlying bone, as I said, it decays away. It creates a cave. It creates a pothole. And so the skin that's lining the, the bony part of the ear canal is also sunken inwards, and it creates a crater, which then prevents the natural migration of skin from the eardrum out of the ear because any migrating skin is going to fall down this pothole and not come back up again. Now they haven't got any ulceration uh, or uh, periosteitis which is an infection of a thin sheath that supplies the blood and nutrients and the nerves to the bony part of the ear canal. So there's no exposed bone there that skin is still intact the epidermis layer of skin but potentially that epidermis layer of skin can become ulcerated by all this other dead skin collecting inside the crater. And that, as, made, as made reference to earlier, this dead skin it releases um, proteolytic enzymes which can start um, decaying and um, causing destruction to the skin that's lining the ear canal, then eventually exposing the periosteum and also the floor of the ear canal, the bony part. But this patient just needs regular clean, cleaning you can see there's a bit of blistering there when I peel that skin away. That's just some um, uh, dilation of the blood vessels. Well, I hope you enjoyed that compilation, guys. Um, quite a few varied cases there. Um, even looking back, I find them quite interesting. Well, take care, keep well, and speak soon. Bye.